such a mixed crowd, especially given the topic, so thank you all for showing up. Uh, my name is Natalie. The way that we're going to run this this morning, because we only have 18 and a bit minutes with you, um, we're not going to take questions from the floor because we've got some exceptionally interesting panelists up here, and I'm sure you're all fascinating too. But if you want to tweet to us, you can. The topic is about hiring for diversity within entrepreneurship and how we can do that better and why it's important. I want to preface uh, the panel just by saying that research from various points in different parts of the world have found that diverse companies tend to fare better, they have better problem-solving skills, they work more creatively together, and so there's a real ROI on being able to hire well. And so what I'm going to do is get the panelists to introduce themselves, and then we will define what the problem is that we're trying to face and to, to solve. So, over to you. Hello, everyone. Come on, wake up. Everybody. Hey! <laughs> okay, good, thanks. So I'm Dakota Liz, uh, Liz Bacelar, uh, founder of Dakota Fashion, is the company, the largest event series in the world for fashion technology and the largest community for fashion and tech. I created the first fashion hackathon in the world and I meet 250 companies a year that only cater to the space. And I'm really sad to say that half of those 250 companies are all male companies with all male boards catering to women. So it's pretty fucked up to fund these companies because they need to fix that problem first. Right, Saul? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Saul. Um, I've been a, an entrepreneur a few times uh, at Love Film. I co-founded Cano with my cousin Alex over there. Um, I co-founded Seed Camp, uh, and I've been an investor at uh, for the last eight years at Index. More recently, uh, starting a new seed fund called Local Globe. A um, few comments. Uh, on, on the topic, I mean, you know, I, I, in, in my experience, uh, and actually, you know, my, my first two bosses were women. Um, not just gender diversity, but sort of ethnic diversity and skill set diversity are absolutely critical. I, I've seen and I've made this mistake myself as a founder, too often founders sort of uh, work with and hire people in their own mold, you know, whether it's women working with other women, guys working with other guys, um, engineers working with other engineers. And I think, you know, there's no question that the best teams are the my, most diverse teams across all of those different dimensions. You want people who can respectfully disagree with you, not do everything, you know, in your own in your own mold. So I think you know this topic of diversity, which rightly face, you know, is is focused on the gender issue, is actually sort of a broader issue as, as well. Yeah. So Heather, hi, I'm Heather Bruner. I'm the CEO of WP Engine. WP Engine is a platform for managing uh, businesses built on WordPress. Um, and we are very, it's a very fast growth market uh, for, in general, in our space. And our company has been growing more than 100% year over year. We're a five and a half year old startup based in Austin, Texas. And just a few stats for us, really diversity has been a huge source of our strength as a company uh, at WP Engine. 60% um, of our executive team are women. Uh, 60% of our R&D leadership are women. Uh, 25% of our overall company, a company of 300 people, um, are women, uh, and 30% of our team is non-white. So we have very strong diversity across uh, cultural and ethnic diversity, and um, we have 35% of our team does not have a college education. So we'll be able to provide an opportunity for people who have tech skills uh, and have the heart to serve customers, but can come in and learn and be developed through our organization and be and grow from within. So it's a very, very diverse team in terms of gender, culture, and uh, economic background. So let's look at some of the ways in which been able, we've been able to do this. So for everyone out there, for all of you, how do you actually hire diversity? And one of the things that you face, psychologically speaking, are these unconscious biases that we have. And it's really hard to, to account for that, because if we've, even if we're aware of them, because they're unconscious, we don't necessarily catch ourselves in the act. So I know that you've got some interesting <laughs> ideas about this, so maybe you can lead this, this well, section. I'm Brazilian, and um, I would love to have an all-Brazilian team, right? <laughs> that would be great. It would be a lot of fun. But I'm aware of my biases, and one thing that I did in my company is I got the resume names to be removed when I read them. 
um, and I only, I only have the skills to look at. I do phone interviews without looking at your photograph. Uh, I don't really want to be tainted by any exterior data points. Um, and then at that point, I have a chat with the team, uh, and then we have an opinion already by when I know who you are and what you look like. Those things really play a role. Um, another thing that's important is, it has to do with what Saul was saying, recruit outside. If you are an early stage company, and many of you could be because you're interested in the stage over here, Startup University, you, you need to act on speed, right? And acting on speed sometimes creates some of these problems because you don't have a lot of time to recruit well. You rely on your LinkedIn and your Facebook friends. So I was always trying to break that too. So when I created a hackathon, I didn't want my hackathon to look like San Francisco. <laughs> it was the most diverse hackathon in the United States. It was 2013 at that point. Uh, we had all races. We had all kinds of groups represented, but I, I sought them out. So you have to seek groups out, seek communities to, to be able to be pools of data for you when you need them. Uh, you don't have to have friends, but you need to have sources, create a group of sources. And if you don't have diversity in your founding team, have diversity at your group of advisors. Some advisors don't have to be equity holders. They can just be friends of the company. Surround yourself with something that's not just a reflection of yourself. So let's, let's pick up that point about founders, because I think that's really interesting. So if you founded and you've got kind of a small team working on your, on your company and you're looking around, they all look like you, where do we go from there to create more diverse teams? Saul, you mentioned something about founders and breaking out of that mold. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's advisors is a, is a great source of diverse thinking and experience, you know, at an early stage, because often you can't afford to, to bring people into the business. Um, but I, I, I think a really important point uh, is, you know, how you encourage diverse thinking, um, not just, you know, when you've started, but as you keep, as you keep going. And, um, you know, one thing I feel strongly about now that technology is so much a part of everyone's life, it's really important to sort of not deny the creative and cultural aspects and sociological aspects of, of technology. I think, you know, a lot of times we spend, um, there's a sort of a geographic bias to the products that we design. So, you know, if you're really ambitious and you're trying to build a consumer product, you should be trying to build a consumer product for billions of people because there are three billion people online and that number is going to double in the next five years. But if you're just doing that based in London or San Francisco or New York, you're going to be creating a product for people with, you know, literally first world problems. Mm -hmm. If you go to Cape Town, if you go to Lagos, if you go to Manila, if you go to Sao Paulo, you're going to have a very, very different sense of what people actually want and how people live. And I think it's really, really important very, very early on in your sort of ideation, product design process to try bake in what, what I, I sort of think of as majority world thinking into your, into your process. Because otherwise, you're just going to end up making something for yourself and your friends, uh, you know, which may get you so far. It may even get you funded because initially you'll be pitching to people who are like you. Mm. But it's not going to create a, a great big company. And I think another interesting point to pull out there also is that when you look at the people who are creating the technology that we're mostly using, historically it's been, well, Palo Alto, Mountain View, all these sorts of tech companies. And there is a huge amount of cultural specificity and bias inherent in the kind of technology that they farm out, which is why well, now in Europe you're just, finding just, alternatives. Just sort of yeah. One further thought on that, I don't think it's a mistake that both Microsoft and Google are now run by Indian executives. When you look at how big mm -hmm. India is mm -hmm. as a market now and going into the future. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's true that there is a sort of a, a, sort of a, a, a white Anglo-Saxon male bias in Seattle and San Francisco. <laughs> But the reality is actually a lot of those organizations have become much more ethnically diverse over the last 10, 15 years and are led by, by 
by Indians. In the they have their yeah. diversity yeah. sprinkles. Yeah. Mm. Right. Mm. So Heather, yeah. one yes. thing that you were talking about earlier really was interesting to me, this idea that you have maybe 25% of the overall um, company is female, but you're talking about having, I think it was 60% of women in high-level high, ro high level mm -hmm. roles. Yeah. What's happening there, and how do you get women into positions of higher authority within companies? So, so when I joined, I joined the business about uh, two years ago, and at the time we were a team of about 40 people, um, and at the t we had only two women in the company. Um, and I think that one of the things our founder, um, by, you know, it's back to the whole thing about having an advisor. So I first joined the company as an advisor, uh, joined the board of directors, and then was asked to come on uh, as CEO. And I think through that, they kind of sent a signal uh, from our board and from our founder that you know, they're welcoming, you know, welcoming diversity, welcoming, welcoming a leader, um, a female leader to the business. And I think that helped to attract other female leaders who said, hey, what's going on there? I'm interested. And so kind of just setting that, just making that move, whether it's, you know, a, you know having an Indian uh, CEO or wh whatever it might be saying, hey, we're open to that. And then I think from that created the level of interest. And then from there, I, you know, to me, I think diversity attracts diversity. So if you as a founder are setting an intention to have a diverse organization, and you set that intentional with, with your employees in terms of what you're looking to, and you're seeking to find, that'll come out. And then if you're creating a really great employee experience where people really can be themselves, so they can, their, their culture can be, their beliefs, whatever they believe, and you create an organization where it truly is, people feel like it's a company of equals, um, and they have that ability to express who they are, that gets out. And then for us, 60% of our employees, so growing from 40 employees to 300 employees in two years, 60% of that's come from our employees referring other employees. So they're referring people that look like them, that share their beliefs. When people who are black, Latino, gay, whatever it might be, they see themselves in, in the employees that are already there, that it makes them interested in wanting to apply and saying, hey, I want to be there. If they're succeeding, I can succeed. Uh, may I just uh, jump in? I, I think you should also allow your product to do the recruiting. Um, you, as an early stage company, founders put so much effort in networking with VC sometimes earlier than they should, um, instead of creating a base, a fan base for the company. Yes. And I think that that's what you should do. You should build the friends of the startup, people who love your idea, forget about funding for a second, and attract fantastic interns. Uh, in some places, the interns will have to be paid. Like in New York, it's illegal to have free internships. You have to pay them. Uh, but uh, when you seek those internships, let the product and whatever you're building recruit for you. And I have attracted some incredibly diverse and so interesting mm -hmm. and talented mm -hmm. pool of interns. And when they perform, because they brought, were brought to you right. as their passion for what you're doing, it's, it's just amazing how they evolve and become part mm -hmm. of your story. Absolutely. And seek them out in the best possible schools. Uh, fight for them the same way you fight for VC's attention. A, right. a fantastic intern is a great asset. Yeah. And I think also with interns, and also your company, um, in order to do, attract diverse talent, you may need to find yourself where you may earlier than you expect have to have some capability in turn for training and development, and so where you're actually thinking about how do you onboard people, how do you bring them through, what's your, what are some of your kind of key entry-level roles that create a pathway into other roles, whether that be through an internship or through um, you know, first-level entry coming right out of university. And again, by doing that, it creates more opportunities. And again, I think for a lot of the people that are joining us, because WordPress itself is such a democratizing technology and has enabled so many different people to make a living off of WordPress, um, without a college degree, it's created an incredible pipeline of talent, of diverse talent for us to then you know, bring into the company and to have them kind of continue to grow. We had um, from our team, you know, from those people that have joined us um, in the, just the last year, over 80 people get a promotion, uh, you know, kind of coming through, doing that training, and then being able to see themselves succeed. All right, so we've got four and a half minutes left. So I think what would probably be really helpful is one concrete, tangible tip that you can give to our people out here about how to build in diversity. I know we've heard quite a lot. So what would you do tomorrow when you're going home? What's the one thing that everyone here can do? Um, I mean, other than what I've mentioned, one thing that, that we haven't spoken about is uh, maternity and paternity. Um, so I know this has become a big issue in, in the last year. Netflix have talked about sort of uh, offering paternity uh, at the paternity leave at the same level as maternity leave. I think Microsoft then followed, but then there was some talk in in the press about it's all very well 
you know, companies offering this, but leadership needs to set the right example and actually, you know, if paternity leave is on offer, senior leadership needs to take it. So I actually think, you know, having as good a paternity policy as you have a maternity mm -hmm. policy mm -hmm. yes. is absolutely critical because... In the US that doesn't mean that much. <laughs> Well, you know, Everything's so for, for me, it's about, it really, initially, it's about equality, Yes. right? And that the, you know, the, the father increasingly is and should be taking as much responsibility in a household bringing up kids as a mother. And actually, the structural inequality of paternity leave versus maternity leave creates ingrained inequality. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I, I would say that it's have a really serious think about your paternity policy because I think it can unlock a huge amount of benefit both for the men and women in your business if, you, if you're smart about that. Great. Thanks, all. How about you, Heather? So I, I would just say again to, you know, to set that intention. So if you want to have a diverse environment, a diverse culture, set that intention as the founder, as the leadership team of the company. Be intentional. It may also mean that you have to invest. It may mean that you have to go reach out to certain groups that you want to party with, whether that's women who code, um, you know, black women who code, whatever that might be for your, in your respective industries. Seek opportunities to engage with them and to bring those people in to welcome them into your company. And I think the other thing is be very explicit about how you think about pay structures, compensation, back to it is important for there to be equality. So you can look across your employees and say, no matter who you look like, if you're at this level in this role, the pay is equal. Great, how about you? I think employee loyalty, it's one of the most precious things you can have when you build a startup from the beginning to have people who are there for you for the long run. And you can only have that if you really create an environment that you believe in them in the very beginning. Uh, when I think about, about my employee number one, if she had gotten pregnant, which she, she didn't, but we have now people mm -hmm. in the team that are getting pregnant, uh, it doesn't really matter to me as a founder uh, because I already have an environment of remote working and I know that as a mom of two, being able to, I wouldn't be able to stay at home for too long because I just can't, I have to work, but being able to work remotely was so precious for me. So if you give them those tools at that, that stage, they stay for you for the long run. It's a great investment. And the last thing is all this talk of diversity, sometimes the ROI is not clear. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah, diversity, but what, what's the ROI? Um, if your product, I, I mentioned about the product in the beginning. If your team does not reflect the product you're building, does not reflect the consumer you're seeking out, you need to address that, otherwise your product won't be as good. So there is that. It's very tangible, the ROI of diversity, think, diverse thinking, and being able to have an environment that, that's a little different than what you are. But reflect your consumer, reflect the world, think global. And it's not part of the, the topic here, but part of thinking global is look at your UR, URL. You know, I think I see a lot of the startups that are not diverse. I look at the URL and I see they also very localized thinking startups, the .ITs, .UK. So if you go for the world and you have globally ambitions, you, you become more aware of how diverse you need to be. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Heather, Saul, and Liz. And uh, if you want to see some of these guys, they're actually going to be at South By, so come join us there too. Oh, sure. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks. Thank you.